we're live there we didn't know that was happening brilliant that's exactly how these things are meant to be morning Josie how are you good morning I'm great I've had a very full morning for the past three hours already so we play football we've got wet we've poured water all over the kitchen floor we've got the trains out we've put the trains back we've done the puzzle we put the puzzle back you know we've we've been living Robin we've really been living because it's been great because I know that your daughter actually she's only sort but she made a very good a, a fantastic schedule it did say 5 17 a.m uh pour water on the floor Monday Thursday and Sunday isn't it mm, mm, mm. she is she's she's very strict she follows the military baby fitness routine uh which is absolutely to the letter and god bless her she's got to do 10 wake-ups a night so it's a big deal <laughs> for her. how are you I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to start off straight away with our show and tell today. I Yesterday I had that thing of because I'm finding new ways of procrastinating so I don't write the book that actually has a deadline. Of course. Um, I decided to tidy my chaotic desk. I found I have a lot of floppy disks that I don't require with screenplays that will never be made from the early 21st century. Oh. Um, I think you should definitely keep those. I, I, I feel very strongly that you shouldn't throw those away. Generally, when I put it out there that I had an enormous uh, people, all the reaction was, um, can I have it? I'm doing something involving art. So uh, <laughs> people basically, all people want floppy disks for is to paint them and <laughs> put them on some kind of canvas. But the things that I found, um, I was thinking in the early days of eBay, when my friend Will Smith, posh boy Will Smith, as he was known on the circuit, one uh, comedian, very underrated now, but a very successful comedy writer, he said, there's this thing called eBay. It's amazing. And it really was a fantastic car boot sale then. And I would buy things like, I, I didn't have a signed picture of Denim Elliott. So I bought a signed picture of Denim Elliott. And then I found this, which I forgot I bought. I also needed an unused sick bag from the film Mark of the Devil. This was a promotional sick bag to show you how fr- the this vomit bag and the price of admission will enable you to see the first film rated V for violence. Yeah. And uh, Herbert Lom's in it. And then even better, I found out that I'd used it as my storage device for the short uh, cartoon book <gasps> of Jack Chick. You Terrifying. know Jack Chick, yes. don't you? I had a dabbling with being an evangelical Christian when I was about 10 and they used to give us them all the time. And I just couldn't believe. And also they were obsessed with this idea of a revival, which like as a 10 year old in Orpington, I was like, I was like this. I have no idea why we need this so much. Why do we need this? What what have you got there? Hi there. Hi. That sounds innocent. That's that's a fun one. This one is one of my favorites. This is about um, how if you watch the show Bewitched, um, you will basically you are in the dark arts, mm-hmm. and uh, as usual, at the end of all of them, oh look who's in the flames of hell! We're in the flames of hell. But I was just, I just like watching Bewitched. I like the man who plays Darren. You're going to hell. So, uh, and I've even got one that's in uh, in Spanish. I don't know where I picked that one up from. Watch out for Gunslinger. Um, what have you got, Josie? What's in your show and tell this morning? This is fresh mint from my garden. And I got very excited because there's quite a few mint plants. It is a very small garden. I need to say it's maybe five paces long and four paces, nah, two paces wide. And so, like, um, the the people who lived here before were friends of mine, the incredibly talented writer, Nell Frizzell, and she just maintained something of a herb garden. I went out and I picked these and I was so excited. And I was like, I'm going to make Johnny fresh mint tea. And then I leant down to smell them. And they smelled of fox piss so deeply and so strongly of fox piss. So um, it's just they're just going to sit here until somehow I can disinfect them with lime juice. Like, I don't even know. Has Nell grown a lime tree there as well? Because this is relying now on a lot of. But apparently fox piss has. uh, I know this is meant to be family friendly, but it's a PG. This is PG rated. (gasps) Oh, God. What's wrong with me? No, it's It's PG rated. Fighting with my family, which is a great film, by the way, if you haven't yet seen it and you're looking for something to see, I think it's on one of the streaming services. Uh, Steve Merchant's Fighting with My Family uh, with uh, Florence Pugh is fantastic. But yeah, uh, Fox Urine does apparently have um, homeopathic uh, qualities. So if you have, if you become ill with Fox Urine, uh, the homeopathic Fox Urine pill will then cure you of the Fox Urine elm. I think that's how it works. So if anything, what I have here is an incredible potent cure for that this is chapter one of Josie Long Apothecary you are fine um 
We are joined by genuinely one of my favourite comedians and someone that I, I really delight in, someone who I first met, oh man, I think it's 30 years ago when uh, I was uh, a, a young thing excited by uh, comedy and uh, I would get drunk and fall asleep in the corner of a flat in Edinburgh and occasionally would be accused of uh, stealing people's boots, which I never did. It's a very uh, arcane way of introducing yeah. and Joe Brand. Hello. 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 How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How how are you doing? I mean, because you are someone who works so relentlessly, and now obviously, you know that that, that work. I, I imagine most of it is not going on. How are you finding this? Uh, you know, in 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 forced relaxed period. Well, I was finding it lovely until you Matt mentioned the stealing boots incident in Edinburgh. <laughs> Which took me back to kind of really, really scary night. Do you remember it? It was it was terrifying, actually. Well, because... I don't know about the night because I wasn't there, of course. But do you want to tell people what? What for for fifteen years you believed I was a, a boot thief? I did. Well, we... I still do. <laughs> Good. He is. No, we we were uh, renting a flat in Edinburgh for the festival. There were three of us. Uh, and we had a guy living downstairs from us who was uh, a, a labourer, basically, worked on a building site. And every night he left his boots outside his flat. So obviously they didn't tramp all over his white shag pile or whatever it might have been. And anyway, uh, one night we had a small party to which you uh, came and... Um, his boots disappeared on the night of that party as people left to go home. Uh, but then what happened was that he knocked on our door at four o'clock in the morning, um, obviously getting up early for work, to say that his boots had disappeared. And if they didn't appear back outside his flat by the end of the day, he was basically going to come in and kill us. <laughs> and we were like pathetic little eh, sort of comedy students and we thought oh he's so scary he was really really scary uh, and so for some reason somebody pointed the finger at you Robin I don't know why um, uh, but investigations came to nothing and in the end I was forced to shove rather a lot of money under his door to stop him killing us because <laughs> I, I think, think it was um it was about 15 years later i think we both we were doing that thing where you sit in silence on on mock the week uh while frankie boyle you know does everything and while we were having these moments of silence that conversation came up and it was uh, you know by that point i was in my 30s and all of that time yeah that 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 burden of a guilt i didn't even know that i had and that was the only time you actually found out i was not the boot thief i think it was ray hannah the uh american lenny bruce imp impersonator and keyboardist because he'd I been cruel to me in the was, past. I think it was Joan Collins. <laughs> I don't even know if she was there, but who knows? It might have been. It was a flamboyant. Well, I'll tell you something for free. Joan Collins has never denied it, has she? <laughs> That's true. That is true. If she had nothing to uh, be ashamed of, she would have come out and said it. It's been a long enough time. Yeah, I'll, I'll check. I'll get back <laughs> to you. That would make a great detective series, wouldn't it? Tracking down older actors for minor demeanours 30 <laughs> years ago. That would be good, yeah. Ray Brooks from uh, The Knack. And uh, you remember Ray Brooks, also a great voiceover man for things like Mr. Ben. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. wonderful actor. And, and did a brilliant album as well. Really good, really good singer. Still, still around. Joe, we've got loads of questions from uh, people that people have uh, sent in. And the first one's from uh, Morticia. And uh, she's really? like, <laughs> the, uh, if you're feeling really sad or worried, what's your favourite film to put on to cheer yourself up or distract you for a bit? Do you have something to uh, kind of hide in? Well, I I do like Airplane, which I know um, loads of people like, really, because I'm scared of flying. And so anything that makes flying seem ridiculous. And um, to be honest, I have actually been slapped round the face by an air stewardess. Um, on the way back from Malta because there was really, really awful turbulence and I did do that appalling thing that starts mass panic of 
standing up in my seat and shouting, we're all going to die. Oh. <laughs> and so the stewardess came up and just smacked me like really hard around the face. And um, it had the required effect. I just... <laughs> sat down and shut up <laughs> there, there is something about once the national treasure joe brand says we're all gonna die then everyone else on the flight from Malta goes well if she said that it must be true yeah there's, there's no way she would I was a nurse i was a nurse at the time so thankfully nobody knew who i was for a start off and following that i did go on a don't be scared of flying course as well and that sort of helped quite a bit the um, there's a lot of you mentioned being a nurse, and a lot of people, a lot of people have were, are, have been asking questions about this, uh, including that Kathy Gardner wanted to know uh, who, which people. Oh, it's actually no, she doesn't. She she wants to know. Do do you think that psychiatric nursing actually played a part in you going into comedy? If you hadn't gone into that career first of all, do you think you would have then had the the drive or the interest to go into comedy? Oh, God, that is. That is almost impossible to answer because I'm not intelligent enough to be my own analyst. But what I would say is that I come from a family where my father was uh, depressed from the age of 12 and didn't seek any treatment till he was in his 50s. Wow. Uh, but strangely, we kind of had a family that sort of joked a lot all the time. And so my very poor attempt at... Um, why I went into comedy uh, is that I was trying to cheer my dad up in the, some sort of weird, rather childish way. And I am quite a childish person, so I've obviously got stuck around about the age of 12 because I like swearing, but I'm not going to because it's 10 o'clock in the morning. And I just like being childish. Ask my husband. <laughs> that's funny because i think we've talked about that before when when i interviewed you for that documentary about comedians and uh and and mental health uh and uh it was i think you said you, you don't think you, there's you any don't... think there's any greater amount of kind of uh necessarily mental illness amongst comedians but the, uh, that most of them are kind of damaged people generally if you want to show off that much with that kind of uh, i think that was your, your your take at the time yeah i i i i, I... I still sort of stand by that to some extent. I think you'll find a huge number of comedians have suffered some sort of trauma in their childhood. There we go. I'm going to leave it that broad. I always say that people always say to me, oh, well, your daughter's got two comedians for parents. Does that mean she'll be a comedian? And I'm like, no, I don't want her to be traumatised enough to want to become a comedian. Want to be a very calm I think person. It should be something very serious, like I don't know, a lawyer or um, a vicaress. <laughs> I would like. I, I don't think. I, if my son became a vicar, I think I'd rather because I always wanted to be a vicar. It was just because I've come from a family with quite a few vicars in. But the, the the lack of a belief in a deity apparently really hinders. Even with the Anglican Church, they don't let you in for that. I can be I kind of Unitarian <laughs> stuff. You know that, that 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 that's about it. But I have a similar experience. I won't talk about it now. But yeah, that thing of cheering up a family member who is going through, who has that kind, you know, has 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 a pattern of of, of depression is. Uh, it's an in interesting, but of course, there's many different things. J uh, Josie, have you got a, uh, a question? From oh, Eddie? well, I, I liked this one, which is an absolute swerve away from what we're talking about. Uh, Alex Kendall wants to know, what music were you into when you were a teenager? Oh, OK, that's interesting. Well, my teenage years kind of straddle different forms of music. So I would say I started my teenage years uh, being really into Neil Young and Bob Dylan. And then I finished them um, at sort of the Clash and the Damned, I suppose. So they're quite a contrast, really. And uh, somewhere in between, I liked a bit of easy listening that my parents liked, um, you know, a bit of uh, Andy Williams, all that sort of thing. Very unpopular stuff, to be honest. But um, I kind of quite, I like a wide range. I also like classical music because my dad played it dawn till dusk and I couldn't keep a pillow over my head long enough to avoid it. <laughs> it's funny because I think we are of the generation where 
rock and roll didn't quite make like my parents as well. My my well. my, my mum literally had the only record she had of pop music really was Rock Around the Clock that she would have bought <laughs> when she was about fifteen, and from that point onwards, the the rockiest the house got was Hooked on Classics, the classic combination of classical music but with clapping in the background and a vague disco beat. It's the things that Beethoven had never imagined were possible, <laughs> and that that, that was she said. This is my ironing music. <laughs> um, also, someone said, "What's the best mixtape you've ever had?" Now, there's a there's a tough one. Uh, what what do I have to list every track? No, oh, like... I was was the one tape that someone gave you, and you thought, "Yep, yeah, this is the person for now." Well, it, uh, to, to be honest and to be entirely um, predictable, it was my husband. So there we go. That works, everyone. <laughs> That's very nice. Don't put you know, Mungo Jerry on it, or just don't put, put interesting stuff on a mixtape that you think the other person's not heard. I, my proudest moment when I was a teenager and sort of, I didn't really have stand up in my life. I didn't really have stand up in my life yet was spending about, oh God, hours of my life with a tape where I put like a virgin by Madonna on it. And then what I did was every time it said virgin, I spliced onto it somebody from Hitchhiker's Guide saying Vogue on Destructor Fleet. So it literally was like like a Vogue on Destructor Fleet. It, it was maybe 50 <laughs> Vogue on Destructor Fleet. And most of the time it didn't fit because it's longer. So it was just an absolute mess. Oh. <laughs> also, if I could just say, when I, when I was a teenager, we <laughs> weren't allowed to watch Top of the Pops in our house. Why? Uh, well, interesting thing, because my mother... Uh, thought that who's a social worker uh, in child protection thought that there was a like, whiff of paedophilia about it. Make of that what you you uh, you may with hindsight, you know. Um, she thought Jimmy Savile was very suspicious, and uh, some of the performers were. So she just didn't like the atmosphere of it. Sorry. Moving on to more family friendly stuff. Have I said anything <laughs> really appalling yet? At least she I was haven't wrecked. Wrecked. Pardon? He was correct. Well, absolutely. I know. Very prescient. That's the, uh, um, the, uh, it is weird, isn't it? With pop music as well, when you think of things like when Madonna first started, uh, the Beastie Boys, Boy George, that kind of thing, um, it is. Uh, the, pop music is still shock. I don't know if it can now. Um, do you know what I mean? I'm not sure for for our kids whether they will be able to have that moment of kind of uh, you know revenge by going listen to this because I find the only thing that the only bit of kind of rebellion that I find difficult is their love of YouTube uh, channels where men who are in their thirties play Minecraft overly. And that, to me, I think is probably as annoying as if someone went, oh, my goodness, what on earth is this sex pistols thing? I think that's, you know, so it's a very different form of kind of capitalist rebellion. Uh, is there a question in there somewhere? No, not really. I was just worried oh, because Lucy had to go off and look after a, little, after a little girl, so I thought I'd fill the time. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That Sorry about that. Very brilliant exposition. <laughs> I, I was wondering, you know, do you, do you know, that, that, you know, you, 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 you have, you, you have, you, 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 musically, is there any, is there anything, is there anything you do find, you do find, find just, going, just going, oh, for heaven's sake, what is this, what is this, what is this, what is this, what is well, I don't know what's worse, a parent that hates what you, what you like listening to, or a parent that likes it, and I think the parent that likes what you like listening to is more annoying, really. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's there's stuff that they that they like, um, and some of it I like, and some of it I don't. But most of the time, I have to sort of be very neutral about it because I think I said if I liked it, they would stop listening to it. There is a nice bit in, in Stuart Lee's most recent show. show. He talks about he talks um, fathers bringing their their sons as if it's you know it's going to be a kind of you know way that we can bond because you know he's really culturally significant mm -hmm. and then the, the father sits thinking that his teenage son's going to go wow dad's really cool he's into Stuart lee and the teenagers just sit there going don't know what this is dad so i quite like that there's still that kind of <laughs> yeah. you know and in fact i was very lucky his show which really is superb i went to see it at the watford coliseum yes watford has a coliseum and uh it, was loved the audience absolutely adored it but it still has people who sit there and go i don't know what this is 
And, you know, and Stuart mentioned of other people who were there, you know, as he sees people going past the merchandise stall, he can hear them saying, I'm sorry, Bill, we're not going to this again. I still don't get it. And I, I think, you know, that's quite a, quite a nice position to still be in. I, I went to an art gallery in Bath when I was when I was on tour and there was a Grayson Perry exhibition and it was all his early work, which is like really dirty and full on and sort of exciting, sort of quite rough. There was a room that was quite like raw stuff. And um, the, a lady walked out with her friend and she said, I, I'm not, I don't regret coming, but I wouldn't like any of that in my house. <laughs> That's the perfect bath response, isn't it? I'm, I'm glad he did those rude things, but I don't want them anywhere near me. Because I remember someone leaving a Robert Maplethorpe exhibition and just hearing them say, well, I liked the flowers. And if you know <laughs> his, his, his work, um, we're going to go over to uh, Luke in, in uh, and we've got loads. Of, also, by the way, apparently John Nicholas tells us it was Thora Heard who stole those boots. He heard her showing off in a pub in Plymouth in the late 90s. Uh, so uh, there we know that. Um, just to tell everyone a quick thing, which is uh, tomorrow morning we have Sarah Pascoe on and uh, we have Natalie Haynes on <laughs> and uh, Ben Norris will be singing some songs. And then in the evening we're doing an extra show. We have uh, Chris Hadfield, uh, the astronaut chris hadfield so if you have any questions questions that you, you know questions from your kids or questions you want to ask chris hadfield or anyone else that i've just mentioned and steve merchant on friday uh send them to us tweet us do anything like that uh, also there's a tip jar uh somewhere on the screen you're probably looking at um at cosmic shambles.com and uh if you enjoy this if you're if you're having fun and you and you can tip a little bit of money we're basically collecting money for some of the artists and performers uh and also venues <laughs> that may well uh, pretty much kind of go under uh, with this current situation with, you know, three months of, of uh, work and events all cancelled. So we're trying to get together some money and that's going to go to various people who uh, are finding it particularly tough at the moment. And if we make enough, we'll be able to distribute that further and further and further. So thank you for any of your tips. And now we're going to go over to, sadly, I was meant to be at the Larn Weekend Festival uh, this weekend, which is where he is always utterly triumphant. Of course, the Larn Weekend Festival is not happening but here is the poet, Luke Wright. Luke Wright. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm going to do three poems for you. One of them is very short with a little one in the middle. Uh, the first one is, um, so back in Georgian times, which is my favourite period of history, uh, we didn't have newspapers. Um, instead, we had pamphlets and broadside ballads. So the high-minded stuff was in pamphlets and the sort of low rent, sleazy, gossipy, salacious stuff were the broadside ballads. And these were large sheets of paper printed on one side uh, with rhyming verse on there. And you could take these... Um, uh, this rhyming verse down to the pub and you could sing it to uh, to music or you could just read it aloud and that's how people got their stories. And so I've been taking a lot of these uh, Georgian ballads and rewriting them for the modern era. And this one concerns a bloke called Edward Dando who was the apprentice to a hatter. Um, and um, he, um, yeah, he uh, he realised that, it, like our own time, Georgian, Georgian period was a period of great... Um, uh, social inequality and he realized that he would die in the class that he was born he decided to take matters into his own hands so this is called the ballad of edward dando the celebrated gormandizer hurrah it's me it's ballad time hang some bloody bunting now shut your eyes sit back we're off to 1820 something the belching georgian after party an age of gout and laudanum where opulence and dropsy spread to all that could afford them the spit roast swine germanic wines beau brummel's ice cold quips the clash of nash's symmetry with georgia's wobbly bits frayed pantaloons and powdered cheeks and boo sucks of the prigs the tories were in power but it was all about the wigs and dandies dashed in hackney cabs from bar to drinking shop a gin-soaked trail of tabs until their foppish face coats popped and just as in our stage school age the slack george chasnay's dream of being auto-tuned and airbrushed into pop's harem so young men walk the gaslit streets of london's rotten heart with grand ideas to take their lives and spin them into art and so our hero edward dando Apprentice to a hatter. We don't know what his hats were like, but they, dear friends, don't matter. For days spent stitching hats for chaps and dando mad with boredom. A line of dandruff decades stretched out miserably before him. A member of that lunar race, the history near forgot he might had he been born later, lined up with Marx's lot, but short on ideology or union or committee. Dando only had a hunch that life was sort of 
crappy. While some were blessed with tails and titles, others buffed their boots, and pickles stewed and boiled the scraps of labour's rotten fruits. Ah, who will pave my grave with jewels? Ah, who will sing of me? The atters, blacksmiths, cooks and fools, all piled up like scree. And that, thought Dando, shouldn't, couldn't be the way for him. So he resolved to live a life of shellfish, beer and vim. So off then to an oyster house with sawdust on the floor. A pile of shells around his boots. Our hero orders more. Shuck, gulp, drop. Shuck, gulp, drop. And all washed down with porter, the swagger of a Don Juan with his mitts on someone's daughter. And when he had swallowed thirty dozen, Dando belched and sighed, performed a dance of pocket packs. What rotten luck, he lied. I'm sorry, Mr. Royster man. I'll have to sue you clear another day. All right, old boy, next time I'm passing here. And had he been a gentleman, the trader would have bowed and sent him, and sent him on his merry way, contented with this vow. But swagger isn't breeding. And no sooner out the door, this whistling cocksure hatter felt the rough arm of the law. They banished our voluptuary to Brixton for a month, where Dando's rage in hunger gave the other lags the hump. They shackled him in solitary for stealing beef and bread, where there the old screws pummeled him and boxed his grisly head. But when his month of gruel was up, he just found the nearest stool, devoured ten dozen oysters and then coughed up bugger all. Alack, his choice of oyster man, this one built like a bull, left our hero in the gutter, sore but very full. So Dando spent his life like this, from oyster house to beating, from shellfish stool to court and jail and all for sake of eating exactly what he wanted to, exactly when he wanted. For every bristling oyster man or judge that he affronted, he gained a hundred new admirers. Dando strikes again, for nothing sate his appetite for oysters, ale and pain till 1832 rolled round. The aged sailor king now on the throne. Austerity in place of George's bling. And Dando, like his royal exemplar, saw his fortunes fade. One August night, in cold bath fields, on prisoner parade, our man collapsed with cholera. They carted him inside, where legend, that forgiving mistress, claims before he died, they brought a dozen oysters to his lycee prison bed. He rubbed his stomach down the lot, and then he fell back, dead. They buried him in Clerkenwell beneath St. James's bells, the balladeers sung songs of him and paved his grave with shells. So that is the first one. Oh, that, that, I can see them clapping. It's very nice. I've got a tiny little short one and I'm going to end on the end of vocalism. So this is um, maybe a lot of you like me at the moment are having to make big decisions and uh, negotiate with your ex-partners as, as we try and uh, find a way through this as, as split families. This is a very short poem called X. We don't touch each other anymore. 12 years in a double bed down to business-like deals we can't bring ourselves to shake on. Not even an X at the end of a text. I'm not saying that I want to. I just wonder where we went. But today you sent a photo of our son. It stopped me as it flashed across my palm. We were there, in his face, in each other's arms. Right, so that's, that's the serious bit in the middle. Right, and I'm going to finish on a type of poem which is called um, a univocalism, which is a type of piece, a piece of writing that only uses one type of vowel in the whole poem. So you pick your vowel at the top, and you can use that vowel as much as you like, but you can't use any of the other vowels, and you can't use Y, because Y imitates vowel sounds. So for this one, I chose the vowel of O, and because um, O is slow and beautiful, and um, you can't really, you can't plan these things, you've got to pick words. So the first word I came up with was London, it's not great. Second one, Bolton, oh, this is fantastic. And you've got Remain vote in London, you've got Leave vote in Bolton. I can, uh, I can start to heal the divisions of the nation to the power of poetry. What if I got a couple of hipsters from London and I sent them to Bolton on a fact finding mission? Now, the more literate amongst you, and I know this is a Robin Ince uh, show, so there will be lots of literate people out there. You'll have noticed immediately um, I've, got, uh, I've, I've got a problem with the word hipster containing two of my contraband letters. A lesser part would have turned back. Not I, I deployed a simple metaphor. So when I say sloths, I mean hipsters. Okay, right, let's do it. Ron's, this is got the idea. So they got a bolt in the middle, a bloke called Ron. He's got a shop that sells a bit of everything, remaindered goods. It's called Ron's Knockoff Shop, and it's in the key of O. Two cool London sloths go north to Bolton. Oz, 
Proto-fop on lots of pot. Pole. Posh kook. Long socks. Brown flop. Oh. Bolton's not so droll. Bolton's not got Rococo blocks. Bolton's got no dons or profs. Bolton's got no dot-com showrooms, no comforts for London cohorts, no. Bolton's got lots of old workshops, lots of soot, lots of orthodox lowbrows who mop floors or drown sorrows. Oh, poor old Bolton. Soz? No. Bolton's got Ron Ock, odd job bod, compost gob, Ron's old shop flogs, knock-off dross, low-cost, low coke low togs, non-cotton, Cotton socks, row on row of dolls for tots, old promo photos of Bjorn Borg, Pooh Brown ponchos, crossbows, off food, goth porn, docks for opods, knock off. Ron's old now, Ron's got no boss, Ron's got no how, Ron knows how to hold forth, Ron knows how to shop for top knock off, Tosh knows how to cough off no good cops. Front of shop, Ron plonked bottom down on worn old stool, scoffs pork roll, down shots of scotch, croons old Motown songs, blows soot, blows snot, blows bottom off. Ron's dog bozo growls soft growls, both bollocks, lollop. London sloth stroll from block to block. Oz spots Ron's old shop. Oh, cool shop, Oz hoots. Hole, look, hole, looks. Oh, uh, wow. Hole drools and Ron's hutchpotch lot of knock-off rot. Oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, Oz. Oh, 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 oh. Look, 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 look. Pooh brown ponchos. So now. London sloths blow lots of dosh on Ron Ox cush of knock-off tosh. Oh, uh, Ron Ox. Good, good. Ron scoffs now. Sod off. Oh, sod off. So north. Ho, ho, ho. Sloths up not to sod off. Sloths up to stroll off. Oh, so slow. Ron lolls. Roll sloth stosh. Lock shop for long month off. Roll on tomorrow. That's me. Thanks very much, Thank Luke. Um, I say, I'm, on, say, I'm on a, online at 8pm every evening on Twitter doing a gig. For, for the foreseeable future. <laughs> we were so busier. We've never yeah. been busier. So, um, the uh, uh, Luke, Luke Wright Poet, by the way, is, is uh, Luke's Twitter handle. So go if you go there, uh, you'll also find out where lots of other places you can find out about his work. And uh, the kind of venues that Luke plays and Josie and, and, and I play as well uh, are some of the kind of venues where we're trying to make money for, for the staff who work there in those places as well, again, to keep those up and running when everything is is back to whatever new normal there may well be uh we want to make sure there are still all of those different opportunities for, and different places where people can create and the people who run a lot of those venues uh already they don't make that much money running those venues and uh they do it because they love helping to create kind of art so uh so if you go to our tip jar you will be able to hopefully uh give something to towards some of those people so thank you for doing that uh joe we've got a few more questions for you before we go there's some uh oh, can I, can sorry I, just, I just want to interrupt and say that hey, about, half, about half the questions are just people saying please tell her she's a genius please tell her i love her please tell her she's wonderful so we need to sort of represent that um yeah i was here. about to say yeah charlie demand a very old friend of mine uh says just, just she's tell a her genius she and well, that comes can, I, can I just redirect that to luke because luke i thought that was absolutely amazing and um, you know, I'm going to come and see you now, and I'm going to throw money at you whenever I see you. So come and walk past my house. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> not now. Don't walk past the house now. Yeah, but not yet. No. <laughs> yeah, we've got past your somewhere. house in a car. Do you have to go out in a car? I don't even know that. Do we know? Can I just say something? I know I'm off screen now, but as the Guardian's just flashed that the Prince Charles that the Prince Charles has got coronavirus. Oh, lordy. You heard it here first. Well, sorry, but we heard it yeah. some quite early on here. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's loads of lovely. Yeah, Neil, Neil Peters just wanted to ask, why are you so consistently brilliant? Uh, Jackie Clune, who I'm sure you know anyway, was a brilliant uh, singer and performer. Uh, how are you still such a wonderful legend? But Ben Wilmot wants to know, what's the best pub in Camberwell? He presumes because you used to work in the Maudsley, there must have been a few pubs that you uh, that you went to. 
Well, um, I, I only ever went to one, so presumably that is the best one in my life, and that is the Grove Tavern in Grove Lane. Oh, yeah, I know that one. And just very briefly, my experience in the Grove Tavern, I was in there with a load of other student nurses one night, and Joe Jackson was in there. Remember yeah. him? Yeah. yeah. Is she really going? Yeah. That's the one. And uh, we were like, oh, Joe Jackson's in, Joe Jackson's in. And um, he was up at the bar getting a drink and some really drunk guy came up to him and went, you must be late, you must be loaded, mate. Get everyone in the pub a drink and got really, really aggressive. And at that, it was, that was the first time I'd seen the less savoury side of fame because poor Joe Jackson looked terrified. And this bloke looked like he was probably going to hit him if he did buy everyone drinks. And so I left at that point because I thought there was going to be a fight and I didn't want to know what happened. But, yeah, there you go. A reminder of why it's sometimes better to still just be playing to 80 people in Burnley. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'm just also, by the way, also, by the way, said a couple of people who I know are watching. Gina is watching in Melbourne, in Australia, with her her cat. Hello, Gina and cat. I'm sorry, I don't have the cat's name. I'm not kind of belittling the cat by you know. And uh, also, um, hello to Dawn, who I know comes to um, a lot of the gigs that Josie and I I do as well. Um, there's uh, Julie would like to know, and Julia is is a librarian. Julie would like to know who's funnier, comedians or psychiatric nurses. Oh, my word. Um, I think it's probably comedians. And that's not a slur on psychiatric nurses. But psychiatric nurses, on the whole, have a really unacceptable sense of humour, which is to do with being stressed out and backed into a corner a lot of the time. And so it's not that it's not funny, but I think, you know, that a lot of people would probably feel that it was a bit unacceptable. And I'm not giving you any examples. <laughs> okay. well, I think that's badly behaved sometimes. Um, quite a few people have asked as well, which if you have any advice, have, have, having, you know, worked some mental health nurse and, you know, and also being quite often, you know, reading around the, the, the subject, do you have any advice for people who are finding this, you know, really difficult and maybe are feeling that they're kind of, you know, fraying a little at the edges during this kind of period of, uh, of, of isolation? You'd have to be a bit strange if you weren't finding this really difficult. And I think that a huge amount of people are. And to some extent, I think we've got to accept that that's a normal reaction. I mean, I know there's this sort of, oh, you, you know, grin and bear it, carry on type of attitude yeah. that, that, that a lot of us have and that we feel we should be being like that. But but I, I don't actually think that that's, that's right. I think you need to accept that you're, you're feeling bad and not try and hold it in because trying to hold it in is worse than actually letting it out. And so I would say get online, get on the phone, get whatever old-fashioned method of communication you might have if you're my age, like two tin cans and a bit of string, and just talk to other people about how you're feeling and get tips from them. Um, to try and find a middle ground where you're sensible enough to be worried to do the right thing, but your anxiety isn't so out of control that it's completely sort of messing up your everyday life. And there are things you can do to deal with anxiety. And one of the best things, in my experience as a nurse, is talk to other people about how you feel and they talk back to you about how they feel. And you calm each other down. Brilliant. Um, Josie, have you got any other questions from from uh, that were sent in that you you wanted to? Uh, I'll just write while you're while you're looking for one. By the way, uh, Andy Stanton, who writes the brilliant Mr. Gum books. I don't know if your kids ever ever read them. They're huge, my son, and and a fantastic musical, Mr. Gum and the Dancing Bear, that that, that was on in the summer. And so again, my, just... my kids only read Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the question that I want to ask is from Jackie Clune, right? And she's saying, she's saying, how are you still an effing legend? And the reason I want to ask it is because one of the reasons I love you so much is I love all of your work feels so like grounded in something so real and present. Like when I think about Damned, I feel like uh, they're just, it just feels very true. And like you've, how am I trying to explain this? It just, Nothing about it feels like you're trying to pre 
pretend to be somewhere else in life or pretend to be someone else or or that you're doing something for the sake of something it always feels like it comes from a very real and very important place and I would love to know like how you as an artist over kind of now it's you know 30 odd years have kept that kind of presence um I, I hope this isn't too silly but I I just look up to you so much because I feel that you're somebody who makes work that feels right and appropriate and real continually and I'm like how do you do that in the long term like how do you keep doing that <laughs> first of all I'm very embarrassed because I'm hopeless at um I'm sorry compliments secondly you've obviously not seen quite a lot of my work <laughs> I've done some really appalling stuff throughout my no. career. <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> you haven't seen Josie. But I, I think with me, uh, to be honest, uh, to me, it's always it's always been because kind of a, a lack of talent, really. I always wanted to be like a good actor. And I went for drama school uh, auditions and I was so humiliated at the first one, I cancelled all the others. And so I ended up doing that thing that, some sort of soap actors do is that they just play a version of themselves <laughs> all the time so then what I was sort of forced to do through my work was to stick to what I knew but in some ways for me thankfully what I knew was stuff that nobody else really was doing anything about like you know psychiatric nursing or social work or stuff like that so I could kind of nick that area and use that and um, I think I think the thing is that you know we're saying who's funnier, psychiatric nurses or or, or, or comics, nurses, doctors, everyone, everyone's got a brilliant sense of humour. I mean, the reality of it is, my big brother Bill is so much funnier than I am naturally. He's kind of a natural comic, whereas I have to work at it. Um, so I think I've just stuck to the things um, that I've always been interested in. You know, I get the impression with Luke and his poetry that he really loves words you know and he really loves history and I think if you love something and you exploit your love of it that kind of comes across to people as something that you're really kind of interested in and fascinated by whereas my dad was an expert on scaffolding and I've never even written a joke about scaffolding in my life. He's written a whole book about it oh my <laughs> word he <laughs> can't sleep he <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> oh man, I'm going to go look for that now. That's we're great. all going to read it. False um, work and access in tubular steel. Yeah, it's really good. Oh, yeah. even from the title, I'm hooked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry for uh, to to Margot and uh, and Kathy and Brendan and lots of other people who, who had questions that we haven't got uh, time for. Thank you very much for sending your questions. If you have some questions for uh, Sarah Pasco or Natalie Haynes uh, or Chris Hadfield for both of tomorrow's shows, send them to us. As I mentioned before, uh, also you know, look at the tip jar. Look at what other stuff we're doing, and there's lots of other podcasts out there. Look at all the other work other people are doing, and other kind of comedy clubs and artists and scientists who are doing lots of different things um so keep supporting them keep going to band camp if you can and uh, oh yeah tonight i should mention as well i'm doing a show uh on here with michael leg and our guests are emma pollock uh formerly of the brilliant band the delgados and uh doing incredible solo work and also malcolm middleton uh formerly of arab strap and doing incredible solo work as well and both of them are on band camp as well so uh, go and listen to their music and uh, and keep them going as well if you if, if you like it and uh, buy that music you should like it it's fantastic Josie are you okay for the the rest of the day what are you up to um well I've got an hour to work until the baby until the baby naps and then while the baby naps I should do some general tidying <coughs> and cleaning and then she and I it's the real highlight of our week we're going to go and pick up the veg bag so it's a really full day for me very full and Joe, what are your plans? Big plans for the day? Lying down and administering various liquids and solids to myself. And also, can I just say quickly, hello, Jackie Clunes. Lovely to hear from you. And she's got a very funny book out about teenagers, if you're interested, because I've got teenagers and they are hilarious. Thank you so much, Joe. All right, pleasure. Lovely to see Thank you. Thank you. And now.
uh, I uh, last year I, I, I toured with her towards the end of the year uh, and she's done various Christmas shows with us, stuff like that. Uh, she used to go under the name of She Makes War, but uh, now she is Laura Kidd and uh, she's got a lot of new projects coming up, which I won't mention yet, but you can find out about them if you follow her, her stuff. Uh, and she is, I'll tell you a little bit more after we've heard her play, but now please welcome to our stage, which is her stage, by the board with the post-it notes with all the ideas for the songs, for the songs, Laura Kidd. Ah. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Hi. Um, I've been writing songs about the end of the world for quite a while now, so I'm going to play you one that's about the end of the world as I saw it last year, and then I'll play you one about the end of the world as it's currently happening. So this one is called Out of the Blue. live to you from my um, attic studio which is where I record everything um, and I'm working on an album that's going to come out next February um, I'm launching a new thing so if you'd like to hear about that and these brand new songs you can go to my old website um, counterintuitively which is shemakesaw.com and you can sign up and find stuff out but this is a song I wrote um, on Monday so uh, the words are here so if my eyes are not at you that's why but this is a song that um is helping me get through this time a little bit. So I hope it helps a few of you as well. This is called Everything Looks Normal in the Sunshine and it's brand new. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Laura Kidd. As she said, counterintuitively, go and look at uh, her previous band name, uh, She Makes War at Bandcamp. Uh, you'll find out. And also uh, to go to SheMakesWar.com as well, where you'll find out uh, about all of what work and the new stuff that's coming up. I should have said yesterday, but I didn't. Happy birthday uh, to one of my nieces, Francesca, who is also oh. a palliative care nurse and who is oh. keeping me up to date with a lot of the kind of things uh, that are going on, a lot of the thoughts amongst the, the nursing community at the moment. So happy birthday for yesterday, Francesca. Try and keep up to date with information from people who are actually working at the front of this, as opposed to a lot of the kind of some of the, the, the gossip and nonsense that's out there. Um, I just want to say thanks again to Laura because it was really thrilling to hear a song that felt so contemporary. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. That was very scary. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Joe Brand. Thanks, Luke Wright. Thank Thanks, you. Laura Kidd. Thanks, Josie. We'll be back tonight at uh, 8.30 with Malcolm Middleton, Emma Pollock and uh, Michael Legamy, perhaps doing some new moving renditions of children, children's TV theme tunes as well. Bye-bye. Mm.